apologize up front that I am not dressed up for the occasion. Uh, this is my jump on an airplane to go see my family attire. So uh, I get to go home this morning and uh, see my family and celebrate my wife for Mother's Day. And uh, so uh, I get to fly out this, this morning and then I come back uh, on Monday. And so um, uh, this morning I just want to talk a little bit about, uh, share a couple biblical principles and, and how this has impacted my life. Uh, first, what you need to know is, like Roger said, uh, confrontation is, uh, is, is something that should not be, uh, it should not be something that we look forward to, okay? I mean, if we're, if we're like looking for ways to constantly, you know, confront people because it's like we have an edge or we, it's kind of, if we're doing it because things make us mad or things upset us, but the confrontation part of things has to come from a biblical, a biblical view. Uh, you know, why are we having a confrontation? Uh, what, what, why is there conflict? You, you know, being able to identify those things. Um, I would say, that for for the most part in my in my married life, um, I have been a what would be termed a rug sweeper. Uh, things that would come up, anything that would be. Uh, that would bring disruption to our marriage, disruption to some things in our relationship. Uh, rather than dealing with them, uh, we, I'd put them on the back burner, sweep them under the rug. But the problem of, of, of continually sweeping things under the rug is that eventually the dirt pile under the rug gets too great and you trip over the dirt pile that's being covered up by the rug. Um, and so uh, about five, six years ago, I, I read a book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and just started reading through that book and, and helping lead a team and through that stuff. And one of the things that it talked about was mining for conflict, you know, not, not mining for conflict as I'm just, I'm, I'm looking for ways to, you know, call people out, put people on notice, but how, how to be able to uh, survey situations and relationships and, and see the trouble points or, or those, those trigger points that are preventing those relationships, whether they're uh, husband-wife, whether they're family-related, job-related, church-related, and what are those trigger points that we can then approach and have a confrontation in a way that honors and glorifies God? Uh, because a lot of times uh, our reasoning from confrontation is because, A, somebody's hurt us and so we want to get back. Um, Somebody's hurt us, and so we want to hurt them twice as much. Or maybe even sometimes somebody hurts us, and because we don't like that direct confrontation with that person, we turn it and focus on somebody else. The Apostle Paul has a lot to say about confrontation, um, and because he lived it. Uh, obviously, he, he was on the, on, the, on the front lines when it was coming to, uh, as, uh, as he would say, a Jew of the Jews, right? And he was mad at Christians, didn't like Christians, was persecuting Christians and killing Christians, and so he was, he was out there. But then also, after he, he gave his life to Christ, after he surrendered his life to Christ, now he was on the receiving end of it, uh, and even in Christian circles, uh, I think of um, I think of in Acts uh, Acts 15. Uh, you, you have time; you can go back and read that. But um, Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement. They were out doing God's work, going from town to town, city to city, planting churches. They had a disagreement. They had some conflict. Uh, they didn't tear each other down. They didn't uh, run to social media and, and, and air out their complaints, right? Uh, but they departed in a way. In fact, they departed in a way where God used that occasion to develop a young man that they argued about. His name was Mark. Mark stayed with Barnabas because Paul was a little ticked at Mark because Mark quit before. Mark went with Barnabas, helped Barnabas do some things. Barnabas dies. Mark goes back to Jerusalem, where he's got some relatives who've been hanging out with this Jesus guy. Mark is mentored by who? Peter. And hanging out with Peter, learning about the things that Jesus is saying, Mark writes, 
the Gospel of Mark. So confrontation and conflict doesn't have to be a nuclear option. There can be and should be redeeming biblical approaches. So here's what Paul says. So Paul, in Philippians chapter 4, um, so I think even when you read these verses in the, in the right context, all of a sudden these verses will mean something different to us. Because there, there are a couple verses in here, right? I'm just going to read a couple verses out loud because these are verses that you and I generally would see on coffee cups, bumper stickers, and t-shirts, because there are some of those, those milestone granite type verses that we get excited about, right? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Oh, here's, you ready for this one? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable. You see, I mean, when you read those verses, it's like, oh yeah, I've, I've seen them, I've read them, I've worn them, you know, it's like you, you went to the concert, you got the t-shirt, and you're ready to go. But let's look at the context of those verses. Here's what Paul says in Philippians 4, beginning in verse 2. I entreat Eodia, and I entreat Syntic to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So in the context of those verses, the context is, hey, listen, these sisters that love the Lord, who serve together, work together, they've done all these things for the good news of the gospel, right? They have a disagreement. And Paul knows about disagreements, right? I mean, he and Barnabas. If you go read the book of Philemon, the book of Philemon, he, he's, he's telling Philemon, hey, I'm sending back the slave who stole from you, and I need you to receive him back because he is not the person who stole from you, he is now a brother in Christ. So what Paul Paul uses in his own life and what he's going to teach us here is that in confrontation, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel has to be the tool in confrontation. Has to be. And look what he says. So I need you to be the referee here between these two women. I need you to help them see who they are in Christ. And rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. When was the last time you had conflict? Or you, well, you were like, whoo, let's get it on. I got, I, got a, I got a let, we're not rejoicing. I mean, he said, he said so rejoice in the Lord, and again I say it, Rejoice. It, which is very reminiscent of what James says, right? Consider it joy, my brothers, when facing trials of any kind. I mean, when's the last time? All right, we're, we're all men here, right? When is the last time that you thought, man, I praise you, Jesus, that my wife is nagging me? Man, I'm so glad, Jesus, that my wife is pointing out my shortcomings. Thank you, Jesus. Now, she's probably saying that. But, but, but Paul says, listen, it's, it's you're, we are rejoicing. Why? I really honestly believe because it's the sentence right before that. Because whose names are written in the book of life. I rejoice even though I'm going through conflict and I have to have this confrontation or somebody's had to come to me. I rejo- re- rejoice regardless of my circumstances because I know Jesus and Jesus knows me. Well, all of a sudden, in the grand scheme of things, salvation from hell, salvation from separation from Jesus, separation from God throughout eternity, 
that's a different outcome than the confrontation conversation that you're getting ready to have. So with the gospel in view, all of a sudden, one of the things I remind myself, I remind my kids, I remind those who are going to listen, uh, it doesn't matter what, how difficult things are. The reality is, is that the people who don't like you or maybe that you don't like, those people, they can't eat you. They can't eat you. They can hurt you. They can try to kill you. They may kill you. But listen, at the end of the day, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Because your name, our names are written in the book of life. So it's the approach. How, what is your mindset? Rejoicing in the Lord. Lord, I thank you for who you are. And I thank you. This is, I thank you for this opportunity to learn more about you and to grow. And so our perspective on confrontation has to be that. It has to be a gospel-centered mindset. Jesus, thank you for what I'm going through because this is only, what, did, what does James say? That this trial is going to lead to perseverance and perseverance leads to what? Character. Character. That's important for me because I have a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. And I want them to mimic, I want them to m- imitate me in the things that I do, in the things that I say. And sometimes that's good, sometimes it's bad. So whenever, um, I'll confess, right? I'll confess. Uh, whenever I see uh, a female that is dressed inappropriately, uh, I have this little, I, I have, I, I learned it from my dad, so that's where I get this. So I, I'm not blaming my dad because I could have broken it. But uh, when I see a girl that is inappropriately dressed, uh, I, I call her a hoochie. <laughs> and so what I've done with that is, is, is to lighten it, make it a little bit more lighthearted. I, I add some like inflection to my voice, and I hoochie, right? And so it's, it's very nondiscreet. And so until I didn't realize how effective that was until we were walking down the street... And all of a sudden, I hear my, at the time, eight-year-old, nine-year-old young son, all of a sudden, at the top of his lungs, say, hey, Dad, did you see that hoochie? I had a confrontation with my wife later. (laughs) Praise God for it. Because it needed to be pointed out. And so we, we, want, we want those that are around us as men, if we're following Christ's examples, we want them to imitate us. And if we want them to imitate us in these topics, especially confrontation, we need to be as Christ-centered, gospel-focused as possible so that we're leading the example and leading the way. It starts off, rejoice in the Lord always it is. Then he goes on to say step two, so is, is making sure prayerfully that, we're, that we're, our eyes are focused on the Lord. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. In other words, be true. Don't distort facts, okay? You can let people know your feelings because feelings are real. They need to be validated, but he says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. In other words, don't lie to better your situation. Don't lie to make yourself bigger, better than the person you're having this conversation with. The Lord is at hand. In other words, the Lord is with you. Don't lie. It's kind of like that. I was like, well, would you be doing that or saying that if Jesus was sitting right next to you? The reality is, is he may not physically be there, but he's there. So make sure that you and I are being true. Don't distort things in the confrontations. Don't, we can't distort things to make people feel worse or to make ourselves look better. It's not Christ-like. And the reality is, is that he's our witness right there, right? He is, our, he is a witness to what we're saying in that conversation. Making sure our mind is right, making sure our words are right. And then look what he says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. In other words, we don't like confrontation. We don't necessarily like the uneasiness when we get around people that we have conflict with. And the solution should be reconciliation. It should be. 
And so I, I may have offended you. I may have something that is. And so what I want to do is, is when you confront me with if I hurt you, if I made you mad, is I want to do whatever I can do. Number one, not to just appease you to make you feel good about yourself when you walk away. But for us to recognize as brothers in Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ, all right, that reconciliation in the Christian world, in our Christian life, in our church, is imperative if we're going to set the example for the world. So I, I, I want to be able to, to, to offer up my prayer. I want to be able to offer up, here's where I am. I, I apologize, I was wrong. So I, I'm going to take ownership of the things in which I, I'm not going to make excuses, and so, God, I, we need a clean slate. We, we need a redo with this person. Or, or maybe it's a confrontation with somebody that, that maybe they're living in a lifestyle and that you need to have that conversation with. And the end goal of that is not to modify their behavior. It's not to modify their behavior. It's, it's if they know Jesus, it's, it's for them to come to a, a, an understanding of repentance or if they do, do not know Jesus, it's to be able to show them the gospel in action. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to hold this against you. But man, I just need the, the way you're treating these people, the way that you're treating me, this is not. And it's to be able to show them the gospel in action. Because the last thing that they need to see is somebody who's just going to come down on them and just tear them apart, shred them. And then you try to follow up that later on down the road and say, well, you know, hey, you know, John three sixteen, Jesus loves you. And their response is, well, yeah, well, you didn't love me two weeks ago when you did this to me. And so we have to be consistent. So he, he says that, that our prayer here is, is do not be anxious about anything. In other words, the conversation that we have to have is necessary. And the more that you sweep it under the rug, the more likely that lump in the rug is going to become. So as you need to have this conversation and approach this conversation, is that you're asking for God to reveal himself in a very real and practical way. Because there's going to be things that you're going to learn about yourself in that process the things he's going to reveal about himself in this process, and hopefully the conversation that you have with the other person, the other individuals, it reveals to them as well. And he goes on to say, and the peace of God which presses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think, well, whenever I hear the word peace, I talk about God, I, I, I have a visual, I, I've been to the Sea of Galilee. Uh, I got to go to Israel a couple years ago and go to the Sea of Galilee and uh, uh, had a whole, uh, at the Sea of Galilee, uh, had a, a tilapia on a plate, head, tail, everything. And it was one of the oddest looking tilapia fish, but it was the best tasting tilapia fish ever. It was really good. It was from the Sea of Galilee. And whenever I think about the peace of God, what it says here, it says, uh, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind. I, I think of Jesus on the boat. He's sleeping. And the disciples are nervous because of the waves. They're nervous because of the storm. And, and they wake Jesus up because and they're like, Jesus, don't you really care what's going on here? And then what does Jesus do? Jesus, Jesus tells the waves and the storms to to be still. And all of a sudden, the sea is like glass. And the disciples' response to that is, whoa, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey? And that to me is just kind of like this ah moment. That that's that peace, that oh. The storms that you're experiencing with these conflicts, with these relationships, individuals, families, whatever it is, there's nothing beyond his possibility. And if I will just get out of his way and allow God to be God and understand that I'm not, I'm not responsible for fixing this person. Are you ready for this? I'm not responsible for fixing me. But I've got to let God work in me. 
I've got to let work God let God work in them. I've got to let God have that peace be still moment in their lives or in my lives so they can recognize the power and the peace of God. And if, I, and if I'm doing the song and dance, if I'm directing, if I'm saying, hey, here's how you fix your behavior, X, Y, and Z, and you've got to do these, these things, and I come down as a taskmaster, I come down as somebody who's, and, and I, that I'm lording change over them, guess what? They're not going to easily recognize the lordship of Jesus in their life because I'm trying to supplant that. Or if somebody's doing that to me, and so that's why in confrontation, it's got to be rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. What am I rejoicing about? My name is written in the book of life. And so God is God. I am not. I cannot convince people to change. I cannot make people change. I, I, I have a 14-year-old son. I, he may be enrolled in military academy by the time I get back on Monday. It's been a rough week. It's been a rough week. Jessica, my assistant yesterday, asked me, she said, were you going to go home and let, you know, you know, give him the hammer, hit him with the hammer? Um, not the hammer that I probably want to. But the hammer of the gospel. To remind him who he is in Christ. To remind him of the calling that God has placed in his life. And to remind him that how he's been treating people around him, number one, is not the way that God treats him. And so it will be a different hammer. It won't be the hammer that I necessarily want to bring, but it's the hammer that God wants. He goes on to say this, Finally, brothers, whatever is pure, whatever is honorable, whatever is uh, just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. In, in other words, our confrontations, the conflict management resolutions, our goal is not to feel superior. Our goal, our goal is not to put people down, but our goal is to do what? Whatever is tr true, honorable, uh, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. Think about these things. In, in other words, in these conversations, how do we point them to the truth, the way, and the life? Now, I understand that you say, well, you don't understand my circumstances. You're absolutely right. I really don't. But God does. I mean, this isn't, this isn't you know, uh, Tony's plan. This isn't, I mean, let's just be honest. This really isn't Paul's plan, right? This is the word of God. So this is what? God's plan. God's inspiration. God spoke the Holy Scriptures, Right? So God's plan of dealing with these two women who aren't getting along is not to rebuke them in such a way where they walk away from the faith and they walk away from the church and they lose contact and they lose this relationship. No, what is he? Because their names are written in the book of life, they're always going to be connected. So how do we bring them together? And so we, it's not that we have this false optimism, but it's, listen, if Jesus, and, and this is my go-to, this is my go-to, my go-to, my go-to, if Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead, surely he can bring these two women together. If Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead, surely he can help my 14-year-old son see his selfishness. If God, if, if Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, surely he can help me see that I haven't been the best husband. If Jesus raised Lazarus, listen, he can do whatever he wants. He can calm the waves. He can calm the storm. If I will think that he is God and I am not, and, and I will think on those things that God, whatever the outcome is, if that means that our relationship is not as close as it used to be, that our, we have to be like Paul and Barnabas and go our separate ways, but still be active in the ministry and have a mutual respect and understanding of each other, man, glory be to God. But my confrontation is not so that I can feel better about myself. It's not so that I can boast about it. It's not that I can be, say, I, I was right, they were wrong. 
And look how he wraps this up. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me is literally what these eight weeks have been about. What does he say? Basically, he says, imitate me. Right? What have you learned and received and heard and seen in me? Practice these things, and the peace and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, Paul's saying, hey, I'm, I've had to deal with this. I've had to do these things before. Imitate me. Imitate me. So maybe that means for you, you have to have a different strategy in how you have been doing it. Maybe your strategy has always been about when you need to confront somebody is, is how right you are or that your way is better. But that's not what Paul says. Paul points him to the gospel. He does. He points him back to the gospel. In fact, when he talks to Philemon, he says, hey, I'm sending back, uh, I'm sending back the slave that stole from you but he's a different person. He's given his life to Christ. He's a believer. He's a brother now. He's not just a slave. And, and if you can't, if you still feel like you need to charge him for what he stole from you, you know what Paul says? Paul models the gospel and says, charge it to me. Don't charge him. Charge it to me. So when you have to have those conversations with with confronting, how is this conversation going to point people, this individual, this couple, how is this confrontation going to point them to Jesus? How is it? How does it point them to Jesus? How does it honor and glorify God? And they're not easy conversations. They're not. And they're not necessarily fun conversations. I had one of those yesterday. (laughs) They're not necessarily fun, but it's like, hey, here's what the truth is. Here's where we are. And here's where God is leading. And so we just want people to see the big picture of the gospel. That should be our goal. Not that they can see how good we are or how great we are or how good we think we are or how much we've done for them or how we can fix them. But how is God glorified in that situation? How can you be an agent to help their eyes see Jesus for who he is? I've been involved in church work a lot in my life. And it's the craziest things because it's a lot of times in, in churches, I mean, literally, I mean, there have been in the course of church in American history, churches who have split over the color of carpets, the softness of pews or chairs. We still have uh, in churches today uh, conflict over uh, styles of music, length of sermons, number of of ministries, dollar signs and cents. But at the end of the day, when all of those things are taken away, there's only going to be one thing that remains, and that is Jesus. And so if that is the one thing that is noble and pure and true and praiseworthy, that should be the foundation of the conversations when we are confronting individuals or in those spur of the moments when we are blindsided and somebody's having one of those conversations with us is to remember, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And then take and receive and ask God to show you and reveal himself to you in a way that it begins to transform you so that those in and around your life can imitate you. 
Last week we closed with, hey, who's that one person you need to share the gospel with? Who's that one person that is heavy and on your heart? So today I'm going to ask you to take another step of vulnerability. Who is that one person in your life that you need to have a good sit down face to face and show them the gospel in a way that helps them to either A, quit hurting you, quit hurting others, quit hurting themselves. Even in the world of business, right? How do we sit down with employees who are not doing what they, they should be or could be doing and doing it in a lovingly way that builds them up rather than tears them down? If we can help their character, if we can help that, we can work on the things like competency and chemistry stuff, right? We can give them those tools, but how, how do we build them up in character. Or maybe, just maybe, as you're sitting there, you can't think of that person that you need to have a Philippians 4 confrontation with. Can I dare caution you that maybe it's you that someone needs to confront? It's always been the case in my life where it's like, you know, you have those what we call extra grace people. You know, who, who are those extra grace receivers in your life? That Those people that they just need extra grace because, man, they just get right there under you. And you're like, well, I can't think of anybody in my life that's like that. And like, well, maybe it's you. Maybe you're the extra grace recipient in someone else's life. Likewise, if you can't think of that person this morning, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a neighbor a brother, a sister. If you can't think of that person that you need to be able to say, hey, I, I need to have this conversation to, to, to help this, these relationships, maybe it's you. Maybe it's you. And what will it take for God to get your attention and how would you receive that or how will you receive that when that conversation, not conversation takes place? I pray for you. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that, that God, you, you confronted us with the, the truth of our situation, that we were dead and apart from you, and you confronted us with the gospel. And because of that, our names are written in the book of life. You didn't just allow us to continue to, to wander away from you aimlessly, dangerously close to eternal separation, but you confronted us with the gospel. And Father, I pray for those people in our lives that we need to have conversations with. Maybe they're bringing disruption in our families. Maybe they're bringing disruptions in our churches. Maybe they're bringing disruptions in, in, our, in, our, uh, in our jobs. And Father, help us to have conversations that, that, that don't point out our bigness or their smallness, that don't point out their faults as much as it points out you. Father, I pray today for my conversation with Braden. You know that I love him. You know that I'm proud of him. But Father, I pray that my conversations today with him would point him back to you. And that you would overwhelm me with that peace to trust you. That you would overwhelm me with that peace that Paul talks about that that passes understanding. And that he would receive the gospel in a way that he would be able to rejoice in you because his name is written in the book of life. Father, I thank you for the confrontations that we have that produce reconciliation. 
that give you the honor and the glory and the praise. So in these next few moments that we have together around these tables, may we pray for these individuals, these people, that we need to lovingly approach to bring restoration and reconciliation. We love you and we praise you and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.